you personally for uh, uh, all your hosting, uh, in addition to the organizers of, uh, of this meeting. Uh, it, is a, it is a treat to be here. Um, today I want to talk about the expanded uh, use of wood uh, as a new and advanced material to build a sustainable society. Uh, so my take on this uh, is a little different than most of what you've heard throughout the meeting so far in that uh, I am interested in wood and humanity, but I'm interested in painting a vision for the future of what wood can be for humanity and how wood will uh, be useful to humans uh, in, in the future. So you see a number of co-authors on this paper out. They range from uh, colleagues at Virginia Tech uh, and uh, some visiting scientists that were with me from Japan uh, to students and postdocs uh, that uh, I'm working with. Um, the focus of my talk is uh, wood is an amazing functional material. It is something that we've worked with for a long time uh, to make objects of art, but also uh, to make structural materials, and you'll hear more about structural materials in Andy's talk uh, later today. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the biological and chemical aspects of what we may be able to do with wood in the future. But keeping in mind that the traditional aspects of how we use wood are very important. And if we understand that past and even the current use of wood, it helps us make better use of wood materials in the future. So this is just one example here of uh, some of the more traditional types of work that I do with wood. And uh, that's all I'm going to show you, though, from the traditional type of uh, artwork uh, that, that I do. Uh, we have new technologies now that allow us to use wood in ways that we haven't previously conceived of. Uh, so one of the things we might be able to do from the biological perspective, for example, is to use decay fungi and more microorganisms not as the enemy of wood, as we typically think of them, but as ways to convert wood to new products. Uh, I also want to talk about using wood as a carbon material. And we, of course, carbonized wood for millions of years. Uh, uh, humans, perhaps just for the two million that we've been around, but carbonization is one of the first things we did with wood. But now we understand how to carbonize wood, and we can under perhaps create new materials from wood by producing carbon from it. And then we also want to talk about creating new super materials, or what I call super materials, and one of those is nanocellulose. And I'm starting some samples around. Uh, Michael, I think you have them up front. Uh, we're just going to pass them around. I'm not going to talk about these nanocellulose samples until the very end of the talk, but hopefully by that time you'll have all had a chance to take a look at them. Okay, quickly, because uh, I've got a lot to talk about here. Uh, the use of fungi and other microorganisms in wood bioconversion processes. We've known for years that we can grow fungi on wood, and we produce foods from these, like the shiitake mushrooms, but we also produce pharmaceuticals from the use of fungi and also other organisms that feed on wood. But we can use these microorganisms now in different ways to bioconvert woody materials to other useful products other than food and pharmaceuticals. And one of these, uh, just as an example, perhaps it's not well known, but there's a lot of brown rotted wood out in the forest. Uh, and I'm sure you've all seen brown rotted wood on the forest floors. Uh, by going through a simple sodium borohydride reduction, you can easily convert brown rotted wood into a phenolic material, a phenolic resin, that has the properties equal to the properties that we have from synthetic phenolic resins. And uh, this is a product that, that can be used. The problem is that natural brown rock <coughs> is a relatively slow process, and it's also a difficult process to go out and collect that material. So what can we do? Well, if we understand the process of brown rock, we can essentially borrow the chemistries that the brown rock fungi use, and we now understand that uh, reduced iron and hydrogen peroxide 
our compounds hydrogen peroxide is produced by decay fungi. That's the H2O2, and the reduced iron is the iron 2. And when you combine those, that's a hydroxyl radical is produced. And the hydroxyl radical is the most potent oxidizing agent in biological systems. And if we can generate that hydroxyl radical very close to, at, at the nanoscale, next to wood surfaces, we can break the wood down or deconstruct the wood. So what I've done is I've taken here in this part of the diagram, I've taken that Fenton chemistry reaction and we're generating hydroxyl here right next to our wood biomass. The fungi also produce catechol compounds like tannins and the tannins are produced to recycle the iron in this process so that we continually go from iron 3 to iron 2. And that allows us to, the fungi to continually generate an oxygen radical system to deconstruct the wood. We can, as I say, borrow from the fungi. And when we do that deconstruction, we can end up with a stream of sugars, and we can do this in a bioreactor. We can also generate those phenolic resins from the lignin portion of wood. So wood is composed of cellulosic materials, which produce the sugars, and it also, it's also composed of lignin, which produces this phenolic resin type material. So these are some of the new ways that uh, I hope we'll start seeing woody materials used in the future so that we can build a more sustainable future. We can also take bacteria rather than fungi, and these are some of the things that we're doing in my lab right now in collaboration with Japanese colleagues. And uh, we know very well that we can convert cellulose to sugars, and the sugars are very valuable. But one of the things we've been able to do most recently is to take lignin, which hasn't been well used before, and to take the lignin in the form of black liquor, that's what this material is right here, Black liquor is produced in the pulp and paper process, and we can now take black liquor, lignin, feed it directly to an engineered bacterium, and when we do that, we can get this bacterium, Pseudomonas, to metabolize all of the components of the lignin and produce a compound down here, which is called 2-pyrone-4,6-dicarboxylic acid. And this is not a chemistry-oriented uh, uh, audience here. We call this TDC. And the reason we're interested in this compound is because we can take TDC and through these two COOH groups here, these carboxylic acid groups, we can polymerize it. We can stick it together and form a long chain. And one of the products we produced is a spandex-type rubber material which stretches four times spandex is used in exercise clothing, uh, uh, the tight jeans that people are wearing now. Those are all polyurethane type materials or spandex. And we can produce that now from a component from wood through this PDC compound. Okay? We want to take the bacterium, Pseudomonas, and move on beyond PDC to produce something called muconic acid. Okay, the, the steps that I'm showing right here are the steps that I've just talked about to produce TDC. But if we take that a step further now, we can modify the pathway in the bacteria to, again, metabolize all of the lignin components and produce this compound here, which is called muconic acid. And why we're interested in that, and I know I'm going very quickly here, I don't expect you to grasp the chemistry, but the reason we're interested in this particular compound, this muconic acid or muconate compound, is that it can produce a variety of platform chemicals, a couple of which are very valuable because you can directly convert this uh, platform chemical into nylon 6-6, so making nylon parts out of wood, and PET plastics. These are the type of plastics that go into Coca-Cola Coca -Cola bottles or this type of bottle right here. So we can make that just by bioconversion of lignin now, and we have the engineered organisms that will allow us to do this. And in Japan, this has already been scaled up to 2,000 liter bioreactors. So it's a scalable process, just about ready to be commercialized. Okay. 
Okay? Jumping to another area now, this is the production of carbon type materials, and we've been able to produce carbon nanotubes, that's what these CNTs are, uh, and we've been also been able to produce other types of high surface area carbon. So why would we want to produce carbon out of wood? Uh, well, we can make charcoal and things like that and burn it, but as it turns out, if you make a very high surface area of carbon, it's an excellent material for energy storage or for fuel cells. So in the future, if we need batteries or supercapacitors, we may be able to make them out of wood through specialized carbonization processes. So wood looks like this, as you all know, on um, the, the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, if we do a pre-carbonization step, we end up with wood fiber that has been carbonized. So there's no more lignin or cellulose left here on the right-hand side. This is lignin carbon and cellulose carbon. And uh, Atenor Satir, is Atta here? There he is over on the side. Atta is a graduate student working with me at uh, Virginia Tech. And Atta's project is to look at this and carry on from some other students that are going to be, uh, that have been working in this area. Okay, um, so I just want to quickly go through a couple of images here of carbonized wood fiber. And as we get to higher and higher magnification, you can see up here on the surface of this fiber, we've started developing pores. That's through the carbonization process. And as we go up in even higher magnification, you can start to see lots of pores that have developed, not just at the surface of the material, but in the interior of the material and that makes for a very high surface area of carbon. If we go up in even higher magnification and use uh, transmission electron microscopy, it's rather difficult to see in this image, I, I think, but you start to see these pores forming, and in some areas, you even start to see carbon nanotubes being formed. And these are being formed by the ablation, or essentially the evaporation, of cellulose as a carbon material that carbon gas then reforms as a carbon nanotube actually within part of the, the woody carbon material, okay? Now, uh, this is a rather complex uh, graphic right here, but if you do a pre-carbonization step first at a relatively low temperature, and then you bring your temperature up to about a magic temperature of somewhere around 450 degrees, we found that you can ablate the cellulose carbon, but the lignin carbon still remains. So essentially what this means is you gasify the cellulosic components, turn them into a gas, they disappear, and that's what creates the, the little nanoscale holes that you saw previously in those wood fibers. So that makes it very valuable for the production of a nanoporous carbon, high surface area carbon, but also we're able to produce the carbon nanotubes. This image right here is just uh, some uh, supercapacitors that we have produced from the carbonized wood, and they appear to have good properties as far as electrical resistance, as good as some of the tantalum type capacitors that are being used now for supercapacitors. And these are some of the carbon nanotubes that are being produced uh, from wood. And other groups are now finding that they can also produce carbon nanotubes from wood using similar processes. Okay? One of the things, and I discussed this two years ago in uh, uh, Dar es Salaam in the Tanzania meeting, is uh, could the carbon nanotubes that we are seeing being formed, could they help explain why Damascus steel swords, the historic Damascus steel, could it explain why those swords were so strong and ductile and had very uh, unique properties. Because about six years ago in Germany, they looked at some of these museum pieces. Damascus steel is no longer made. They lost the secret to how to make it about 300 years ago. And the um, carbon nanotubes were found in these museum pieces within the steel. So how did those carbon nanotubes get there? in blades that were made a thousand years ago. Okay? We don't know, but we now know how carbon nanotubes can be made from wood, and we also know that they used wood to carbonize that steel in the early days of steel making. 
So it's one of the mysteries that we're looking into in the lab, and Atta is uh, one of the people that's looking into it, and we'll see how far he gets to his, his thesis to, uh, to resolve this mystery. Okay? And the last thing I want to uh, cover is these super materials from wood, and hopefully the samples I've passed around, uh, most of you have been able to, uh, to see so far. Uh, we're producing nanocellulose in our lab, and a number of other labs around the world are producing nanocellulose. Essentially what you do is, uh, one of the ways to produce nanocellulose, is you start with pulp from the wood, the bleached pulp, and you take and you run that pulp through a nanohomogenizer, which is nothing more than a huge pump, and you pump it through a shearing process, so some very fine nozzles, and what you end up with is a gel like this material and one of the little baggies there that says, please do not open, uh, <laughs> that contains this clear gel that you, you see here. So you can squish that around a little bit uh, using, uh, using your fingers, but don't open the bag. Um, what we can do with nanocellulose, it has very unique properties. And for example, we can fill a syringe with nanocellulose gel and inject it into an acetone bath, and we can produce a little string. Okay, that string, why is it useful? Because nanocellulose has very good mechanical properties. Now remember, this is directly from wood materials. Uh, the mechanical properties, though, of nanocellulose are on par with titanium or Kevlar, 120 gigapascals up to 140 gigapascals. Very strong material from wood, okay? So one of the things we've been doing is we've been taking this nanocellulose gel, putting it in a syringe, injecting it directly into a composite. And it's not easy to see this here, but this is 20 layers of fabric. It's carbon fabric, which has been impregnated with epoxy, and then we take this a little further and inject nanocellulose directly into it. So this is an injection needle right here that's uh, going through those fabric layers. We then press the carbon fabric together in a hot press. So we heat it up, press it to form the composite, make a composite layer like so, and then pull that material apart to test the strength. And one of the problems in, the, in military aircraft and other uh, high-end aircraft, which are made out of this type of carbon material, is they get the lamination of carbon composites. So how do you make these carbon composites stronger and prevent delamination? Well, we said, hmm, cellulose is a good material. Why don't we put that in these types of composites? And when we did that, and this is very preliminary data right now, but these, this upper line right here, upper set of points, this is our nanocellulose reinforced carbon composite versus the unreinforced carbon composite and we've got about a four times increase in what's called fraction toughness just by adding wood, nanocellulose, to these uh, composites. So we have a space age material that we're improving by using a component of wood. And again, we need to do much more work on this to understand how it's going to work. Some other things that we can do with the nanocellulose, and one of the samples you have there is kind of a spongy white thing. Uh, that is a nanocellulose aerogel. We can use that for something as simple as packaging material, but in uh, its wet state, it makes a very good wound dressing. So they're using that, and people are starting to use it now in the biomedical area because cellulose materials are very compatible with the human body. So these are some of the things we're working on from medical dressings through to packaging materials. Nanocellulose, you've seen the material that's going around now, it's optically clear, it's a clear gel, but you can also tune that to any color of the rainbow. So being as strong as it is, you can make perhaps ballistic shields or windows from this material, but by running an electrical current through it, you can change the color of the material. Again, cellulose, because of its crystalline nature, is a very unique and uh, highly valuable in that way. Okay, so to finish off, uh, relative to wood and our future culture uh, and human culture, it's important to understand the traditional cultural aspects of how we use wood materials 
and we've heard a lot about that in the talks so far. Uh, but it's also important to visualize how we can use these materials, wood materials, in the future by breaking them down, breaking wood materials down into their component parts and using those component parts in new ways. Why do we want to do this? Because we cannot rely on petroleum resources forever. Okay? And some of you may ask, gee, are there enough trees to go around? And that's really not the way to look at it. We know that there's not enough oil to go around, and there will not be enough oil in the future. So we must be able to make our natural resources go farther and to manage our forests properly so that we can have a sustainable future and make new products and keep inventing new products for that sustainable future. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you for listening and also uh, in, in addition to Nami and uh, my good friend Chahat uh, Tasteglu in the back, who was my former student and now is a professor at uh, Duce University. Uh, Chahat and Nami have been excellent hosts for me here. Uh, in addition to my IWF, uh, IWF uh, IWCS uh, leadership, uh, Mike Howe and all the staff here, I really want to express my appreciation to you.